Well, good morning, everybody. It's so good to be back. It's good to be back and to see everybody here this morning. And thank you to our online ladies for joining us today. Let's pray before we get started and invite the Lord to be with us. Father, we thank you so much that you have kept us safe through the summer. And here we are again back to break open your word and we just praise you we praise you lord for each one who is with us and has joined us today thank you for your word and i pray for your holy spirit power to just give us strength to receive what you're going to say to us i pray for your anointing father give me clarity of speech and mind today lord that your name be praised all glory and honor goes to you and we worship you today Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Let me just take care of a few housekeeping things um, right here in the beginning. I think most of you know this, but our bathroom are in the lobby, kind of kind of in the middle if you go out those doors. Um, water is the only drink that we allow in the sanctuary, so um, finish your coffee before you come in. If you're comfortable setting close to one another and moving in a little closer, that's fine. You're welcome to, but you don't have to. Uh, we can still manage that. We have the whole sanctuary, so we can sit anywhere we want. You can have a new chair every week if you want. <laughs> we will be meeting every Tuesday at 10 o'clock. Um, November the 16th will be our final lesson in here. Uh, that ends up being the week before the week of Thanksgiving. So it's right before we get all busy with the holidays, November 16th will be our final lesson in here, and then we'll come back in January. We also have the sanctuary open at 9 o'clock every Tuesday morning. So if you want to come in and just have a time of prayer, this is open. Pastor Roger has the music on, and it's just a great time to come in and pray. And if you're able to do that, I'd encourage you to. It's just a great way to kind of open your heart, prepare your mind and spirit to receive what God is going to say. It kind of gives the Bible study a turbo in your life when you spend time in prayer. So you're welcome to do that if you want. You probably received a scripture sheet when you came in. If you didn't get one, just wave at me and um, pastor will help me out there. Anybody who didn't get a scripture sheet, I think are they, they're pink today. Um, so you can get that. I do make a lot of Bible references in here, and this just makes it easy where you're, where you're not having to write down all the numbers and, um, you know, get, get all fixated with that. The way to kind of use this sheet, even after we're, we're not here on Tuesdays, is to go back and read through those passages. It'll help you get a lot fam more familiar with your Bible, learning where different books are and stuff. And because you just heard it in here, then that information is going to be more solidified in what we talked about. And it just really can help seal what the Holy Spirit might be speaking to your heart. So I encourage you to do that within the week after we've met, go ahead and take that sheet and look through those verses and just find them and read them and let the Holy Spirit seal what he wants to say to you since we had just met together. I do send out emails each week to this group just to remind us, you know, of the study or different things we have going on. Uh, maybe a devotion that the, I feel like the Lord wants me to share with you. And if you're not receiving those emails, you want to get them, then my email address is at the bottom of that sheet, Rebecca at flag.church, and that's R-E-B-E-K-A-H, a little different spelling of Rebecca there. But just shoot me an email and I'll, I'll add you to that list. If you did not get an email from me yesterday reminding everybody to come, and, you, and then you're not on the list. So just shoot me an email and I'll make sure that you're, you're on the list. I don't um, give it out to anyone. I send it as blind copy. I haven't sold the list yet. <laughs> so it's all very safe. It's just this group in here. Also, on the first Tuesday of each month after the Bible study, we go to a lunch at a restaurant somewhere nearby just to kind of get to know each other. Sometimes you can't always have time to visit or fellowship in here, and that's really what part of this group is all about is getting to know more ladies and connect. So in a couple of weeks, the first Tuesday of October, we'll, we'll go eat somewhere, and I'll let you know. I'll keep you posted on what restaurant that is. These studies are online, so if you do happen to miss one, you can go back and look at them. Go to the church website and click on watch, and you should find them listed there. And there should also be a button or somewhere connection to close to that where you can also click on to get the scripture sheet if you need that. And if you can't get it to pull up or whatever, just let me know, and I can, I can send that to you. 
This is a non-interactive study, meaning we won't have discussion in here during our time together. But if you do have comments or you have questions or maybe something I said wasn't clear, send me an email. I'd love to hear from you and we, we can talk about it that way. There is a passage of scripture that I want to share with you this morning real quick before we, we get started in Mark that has really ministered to me this summer. I don't know if you're like that, but sometimes you just study a passage and it just kind of resonates like for weeks in your spirit and like almost kind of on a weekly basis, God shows you something new from that passage. And that happened to me early on in the summer. Um, it's found in Ezekiel 37. It's a familiar passage to some of us where the prophet Ezekiel is led by the Lord to a valley of dry bones. They've been there a while. They're skeletons. They're very dry. They're brittle. We don't know the story of the skeletons. We don't know how they got there. We don't know why they're there, how many it was. We don't even know if this was actually a place or if it was just something that God was showing the prophet in a spiritual sense, like almost like in a vision. But Ezekiel saw these bones and he walks around them noticing that there's a lot of them and they're very dry, very dry. And Ezekiel is looking at this open graveyard and God asked him the question, it's in verse three of Ezekiel 37, son of man, can these bones live? And I've always been amused with Ezekiel's answer. He's a very good prophet, very obedient, and he gives an excellent response. Oh, Lord, you know. <laughs> what are you going to say to a question like that? Can they live again? And you're looking at this pile of dry bones. Very safe answer. Oh, Lord, you know. And so then God tells Ezekiel to speak to these bones, these dry, old brittle bones, just all scattered there in the valley. And God tells Ezekiel to say to them, oh, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. And then God goes on to tell Ezekiel what his plans are for those dry bones. I will make bones come to life. I will attach tendons to the bones, he said. I'm gonna make flesh come up on them. I'm gonna cover them with skin. I'm going to put breath in them and they are going to come to life and they will know that I am the Lord. Now that's incredible plans for a pile of dead, dry bones, brittle, washed up bones. They're going to live. They're going to have breath. They're going to have muscle and tendon and ligaments and they're going to have skin and they're going to have working brain cells to be able to process that God is the Lord. And in verse 10 of that chapter, it says, they would become an exceedingly great army. Can you just imagine as Ezekiel is looking at this pile of bones and he is speaking prophetic words that are totally opposite of what he is seeing. The words that he is declaring what will be is nothing, not even remotely close to what he is seeing at the moment. What he is seeing is not matching what he is saying. Are, are you getting the contrast and the, like the complete paradox that's there? But if you go on and you read the rest of that passage, you will see that God was faithful to his words. And yes, those dry bones came together. They received muscles and skin and breath and they stood on their feet. And it doesn't say it in the scripture, but I can't help but believe that when they got their skin and they, they got their brain cells, they were all praising the Lord and worshiping him. This exceedingly great army. What an incredible miracle took place that day. But it all began with one command. Oh, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. And if you think about it, those bones didn't even have ears to hear. They didn't have a brain at that time to comprehend. But still the command was, hear the word of the Lord. And as I've meditated on that phrase this past summer, I've just come to appreciate in an even greater way the power of the word of God. It seems impossible, but dead places can come to life again simply because of the word of God. 
Places that have been dry for a very long time can spring forth with life because of his word. Nothing is without hope because of the word of the Lord. Even pieces of our lives, maybe scattered all over a dry valley, they can come together in order and they can demonstrate now wholeness and wellness because of his word. There is great power, incredible power. We can't even imagine in this word. We have to read it, we have to say it, we have to believe it by faith. It is a faith journey. Think of Ezekiel that day as he spoke the words. Wasn't matching what he was seeing. Oh, but suddenly there was a rattling. (laughs) What a beautiful rattle that must have been. (laughs) Everything began to happen just as Ezekiel said it. And my prayer for this study, for this fall session, is that these words... The word of the Lord will bring life to those dead places in our hearts, to all of those dry places, that these words will gather together the pieces, scattered pieces maybe of our hearts, our emotions, our mind, and as his Holy Spirit breathes upon us, we're gonna come together in wellness and wholeness, individually and then as as a corporate body and become this exceeding great army, knowing that he is the Lord. Don't take offense, but I'm praying, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Dry bones in me, hear the word of the Lord. Let's hear the word of the Lord and let's live. And just as the Bible described it, we're gonna stand on our feet and we're gonna become a great army for the Lord, Amen? amen? So you know what my prayer is? For this session, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. (laughs) Well, let's get started and begin our journey in an action-filled book. The book of Mark is very similar to the book of Acts in, in that there's a lot of activity. And this is always, these Mark as well as the book of Acts are always fun books to read with your children like that or maybe a little bit older because there is so much activity. There's a lot of movement in those books and you know their little minds have a short attention span so it's, it's good they can handle that. So Mark is a good place to go. It's very action filled. The emphasis in Mark's gospel is the activity of Jesus. The activity of Jesus. More what he did than what he said. Mark's approach was more on the miracles of Jesus versus how some of the other gospels focused on the deity of Jesus, his birth, his genealogy. And Mark does a great job describing in vivid detail of Jesus' miracles in this gospel. In fact, there are more miracles recorded in the gospel of Mark than any other gospel. And we'll find as we go through this book that Mark loves the word immediately. Immediately, or some variance of that word is used over 40 times in this gospel. And in most instances where we see immediately, it's because Jesus has shown up and he's changed the situation from whatever it was. And as the old song says, all things are changed when Jesus comes to stay and he's able to do it immediately. Aren't you grateful for the immediate power of God, the suddenly power of God? I love it when he does suddenlies in our life. Suddenly it was changed, immediately it was changed. Sometimes he doesn't always do immediate, but I tell you what, I love it when he does. (laughs) The Gospel of Mark, written by Mark, also known as John Mark. He was not an original disciple of Jesus, but closely associated with those who were, and many scholars think primarily with Peter. Now this gospel was written for the Christians who were living in Rome. The Christians in Rome offered, suffered great persecution for their faith. And so Mark wanted to strengthen the foundations of their faith in Christ by sharing with them, reminding them, some of them who might've known, what Jesus did while on earth, what power he had demonstrated on earth. And also in this gospel, we're gonna see Jesus, yes, as the son of God, but also as a servant. 
as a servant. As Mark records Jesus' miracles and his interactions with people around him, he shows Jesus as God's servant sent to earth to minister to suffering people and then ultimately to die on the cross for the entire world. And there's probably no better key verse in this gospel than in Mark 10, 45. For even the son of man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. And for suffering Christians in Rome, how reassuring to be reminded of the servanthood of Jesus, his his kindness to suffering people. And as as we go through this gospel, we're gonna see Mark make several references to suffering as a cost of discipleship. But he also talks about God's vindication following that suffering, God's reward. And we certainly see that in Christ's resurrection. So let's look a little bit into the life of Mark, John Mark, the author of this gospel. It's thought that Mark grew up in Jerusalem. In Acts 12, 12, we are told that his mother, whose name was Mary, had a house there. And this house was used as a gathering place for many of the disciples of Christ. If you remember the story of Peter, when he was in prison and he was escorted out by the angel, that was in chapter 12 of Acts, Peter went to this house. The disciples were all there praying. Remember Rhoda, the servant girl, couldn't get anyone to believe her. Peter is here. (laughs) Mark was probably there that, that night. So it's possible that Mark living in Jerusalem was eyewitness to many of the miracles that Jesus, that he writes about, that he records for us. Now it's thought that Mark, it is thought, we're not know for, we don't know for sure, but it's thought that Mark is actually writing about himself in Mark chapter 14, where he describes a young man hovering close by at the arrest of Jesus. Now this is one of those interesting passages in scripture. So I want to read this for you. You know, there's just some interesting passages in scripture. It makes it so fun. Jesus has been arrested by the Roman soldiers. He's, the, the mob is there, this angry mob. All the disciples have left Jesus. And then starting in verse 51 of Mark 14, it says, Now a certain young man following him, following Jesus, having a linen cloth thrown around his naked body, And the young men laid hold of him and he left the linen cloth and fled from them naked. (laughs) Now those two verses are just stuck right in there. (laughs) I told you it was interesting. (laughs) We don't know for certain that this young man was Mark, but many Bible teachers believe that it was. He didn't want to give name to himself, but he does indicate this. Now, Whoever this young man was, he probably wasn't expecting to be grabbed by the mob, but he just kind of wanted to come and watch from a distance. We're not sure why he only had a linen cloth. We, I don't want to go there, but very interesting. This man had come to watch this. If this was Mark, let's just speculate here. If this was Mark, I believe that it was probably a very strong turning point for Mark in his his response to Jesus and to examine his behavior with Jesus because he runs away from this whole experience, leaving Jesus behind, being arrested by the soldiers and the angry mob. That had to have done a work on his, this young man's life, whoever it was, if it was Mark. Now, we know later from the writings of Peter that Mark becomes very close to Peter. Peter makes reference to Mark in 1 Peter 5.13. He calls him my son. And so I kind of wonder if there was some sort of connection between Peter and Mark because both of them may have felt like that they betrayed Jesus. Peter actually did, denying Christ three times, but maybe Mark feeling he had betrayed Jesus by running away. Now, granted, he lost his sheet or whatever it was, so, you know, he had to leave, I guess. But there was a sense of sadness, no doubt, in Mark that maybe they sh- he shared with Peter and that they had somehow failed the Lord, that they had abandoned the Lord. 
Just something to think about. And again, we don't know if this young man was Mark, but it's interesting that he includes this in his gospel. These two verses just kind of setting there. So we can't skip over that, you know. Now, probably the most familiar place where we see Mark is in his travels with the Apostle Paul and Barnabas. And that we see in the book of Acts. Acts 13 tells us that Barnabas and Paul are sent out by the church in Antioch for a special missions assignment. We're not told in the beginning of that trip that Mark is with them, but later on, Acts 13, verse 13, we see that Mark leaves them. There's reference here that Mark leaves the group and he returns to Jerusalem. It says, when Paul and his party set sail from Pamphas, they came to Perga in Pamphylia and John, John Mark, departing from them, returned to Jerusalem. Now, we aren't given any particulars as to why he left the group. No detail there, but we just know that he left. Paul and Barnabas, they continue their trip and they return back to Antioch. So now let's see what happens. If you look over in Acts 15, starting in verse 36... Then after some days, Paul said to Barnabas, now they've been back from this trip and they've been in Antioch for a little bit. So after some days, Paul says to Barnabas, let us now go back and visit our brethren in every city where we have preached the word of the Lord and see how they are doing. Now Barnabas was determined to take with them John called Mark. But Paul insisted that they should not take with them the one, and this is how he, they, he does, the writer here, Luke, doesn't use Mark's name again, but he describes Mark, the one who had departed from them in Pamphylia. I think that speaks volumes. <laughs> he doesn't write Mark's name again. He describes him as the one who had departed from them in Pamphylia and had not gone with them to work. Now look at verse 39. Then the contention became so sharp that they parted from one another. And so Barnabas took Mark and sailed to Cyprus. Paul chose Silas and departed, being commended by the brethren to the grace of God. And he went through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. (laughs) Mark leaving the group back in Acts 13 was obviously a powerful memory for Paul. And he, wasn't want, he didn't want it to be repeated. He wasn't pleased that Mark had left them. And he, I, he didn't trust that Mark wasn't going to do it again. And as we see here, Paul stood firm in his belief Mark should not go with them on this second journey. And Barnabas stood just as firm in his belief that he should go. And both men are so convinced that they are right, there was no agreement that could be met between them, and so they parted ways. And Paul takes his new partner, Silas, and Barnabas continues in a different direction with Mark. Now, there's been a lot of discussion in the church world if this ministry separation was a good thing or not. I'm not going to get too deep into that today. That can be your homework to read those passages and develop your own position. It's not going to make a difference to get to heaven, so don't spend a lot of time there. (laughs) But I do think there are some takeaways from what happened because the scripture does share it with us. And so we can learn from that. We do know we're not given any more information about Barnabas and Mark's travels. They're not recorded for us in scripture. And in fact, we don't hear of Barnabas again. We know the focus, the rest of Acts, is on Paul's travels not those of Barnabas. Now, whether that means something good or bad or not, again, you can decide that. We do hear of Mark again, though. Paul writes in Colossians 4.10 that Mark was with him at the time he's in prison, and Paul exhorts the church in Colossae to welcome Mark when he comes to visit them. So there's no lingering hard feelings or bitterness on Paul's part. Mark is now helping Paul. Paul also makes reference to Mark In his note to Philemon, he calls Mark his fellow laborer. That's in verse 24 of Philemon. And when Paul is writing his final letter while in prison in Rome, he tells Timothy in 2 Timothy 4.11, get Mark, bring 
him with you, for he is useful to me in ministry. So somewhere, something happened to change this relationship between Paul and Mark. Had Paul become more compassionate, maybe more patient with someone like Mark? Or had Mark finally grown up and had proven himself now to be a faithful worker? We don't know. We just see that at this point in Timothy, Paul needs Mark and he asks for him because he believes he would be useful for his ministry. And I think probably one of the greatest takeaways from this history of Mark that we see is the encouragement. We all have opportunity to grow up, to change. I love the verse in Ephesians 4.15 that talks about us growing up in all things. Let me read this, Ephesians chapter four, verse 15. But speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things unto him who is the head, Christ. Growing up in all things into Jesus Christ. We all have to grow and develop in our journey and our relationship with Jesus. You know, we start out as baby Christians and we never have it all together right away. We mature in our faith. We, we grow more solid, more steadfast, more, more patient, more compassionate. The, the longer we're following Christ, we should be growing up in him, producing more fruit. And this should apply not just in our personal lives, as we look in the mirror, <laughs> and we interact with our our families and our homes, but it also should be as we fulfill our ministry assignments, a growing up into Christ. As I was preparing this study, I was reminded of a time many years ago, many years ago now, (laughs) I was probably about 19, and I was helping out in the, the youth ministry at the church where I was attending. And so I led the, the youth services each week and I would plan a lot of their activities. And there was one lady in the group, I'll call her Lucy. No offense to any Lucys. I'll call her Lucy. And um, she was very bossy and she knew everything. <laughs> and it just had a way of grating on my nerves. Do you ever have that? <laughs> just... And I would get so annoyed with her. So one night at the youth service, Lucy brought some visitors. It was a brother and a sister, a boy and a girl, and I didn't have opportunity to meet them before the service. So as I was giving my opening remarks, you know, welcoming everybody, I noticed this new, these new people setting by Lucy. And so... I turn to them and I say, you know, welcome. We're so glad that you're here. Glad you could be with us. Nice to see you. You know, would you introduce yourselves? Let us know who you are. Well, immediately Lucy takes over and she starts telling us their names and where they're from and just goes on and on and on and on. And so I'm a little annoyed, but I'm good. So I turn to the, to the boy and the girl And I started asking a few more questions, trying to encourage them to talk, you know, to interact. They're the ones we're greeting, we're celebrating that are here. Well, there she goes again. Lucy just takes off. And I lost it. (laughs) And I turned and I looked at Lucy and I said, are they just not able to talk? (laughs) Well, they weren't. They were deaf. (laughs) So... (laughs) Needless to say, I was very embarrassed, but more so I was convicted because I had lost it with Lucy. (laughs) It was totally inappropriate and um, it was a growing opportunity for me. (laughs) We all have to grow up into Christ in our personal lives, and certainly as the Lord begins to use us in ministry, there's just a growth that has to happen and a continual growing. I've made many blunders since 19, (laughs) but we have to continue to grow if we're gonna be effective for the kingdom of God in in our testimony and in our witness. 
You know, when Jesus shared the parable of the sower, he talked about the good soil producing fruit. In Matthew 13, 23, he said that some of that good fruit uh, produced uh, fruit, some of that good soil produced fruit at a hundredfold, but some of it did not. Let's look at this. Matthew 13, verse 23 But he who received seed on the good ground, this is good ground, is he who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and produces, but look at this, some a hundredfold, some 60, and some 30. Good soil, It represents those who received the seed, who heard the word, they believed it, they understood it. But from what Jesus is saying here, even though it's good soil, it's not producing as much fruit as it should. That's a very sobering verse and it should speak to us. Are we producing all the fruit we should be producing? Are we at a hundredfold? Now, obviously, the Lord desires all of us to be at a hundredfold all the time. But just as a plant, he has to grow into full maturity. And the more it's developed, the more it's going to produce fruit. Certainly, as we grow in our walk with the Lord, we're going to be producing more fruit. But Jesus holds us accountable for what we know in him at that given time. Luke 12, 48 tells us the words of Jesus, to whom much is given... From him, much will be required. The more we know of Christ, receive from him and his word, it's going to be expected that that knowledge we have at that point would produce more fruit than at a previous time when we didn't have as much knowledge. Certainly, as a new believer, we're not going to have as much knowledge as someone who's been serving the Lord 10, 20 years but with the knowledge and the relationship we, that we have with Christ at that time, our fruit could still be a hundredfold because where you are at that point in time with him, do, do you see that? It has to do with our surrender to him, to crucifying our flesh, nurturing our love for him, his presence, his word. And I believe our prayer should always be, Lord, let me today, with what I know about you and where I am with you, let me be producing a hundredfold in my life. And something else, if there are those around us not producing a hundredfold, oh, Jesus, help us be more patient with those Lucy's (laughs) in our lives. We must pray for one another that we all can rise up and begin to have stronger, better fruit production. And I think we could also ask the question, are there times in our lives when we produce more fruit and then other times we're not producing as much? Do we fluctuate in our fruit production? Is there a pattern of fluctuation? Or are we just steady and we're consistent? We're constantly growing. We're constantly open to what he wants to do. Okay, this is a tough spot, God. What do you want to show me? What fruit do you want to produce in me? Or is there, no, I'm going to shy away from that one. I'm going to take a break. I've been producing a lot of fruit. I just came through this really hard time and I'm done. No, we want to be consistent. We want to be consistent. We want to be steady. It's something to to think about as we look at what we're told about Mark. Because I believe that Christ is calling for all of us to produce at a hundredfold. And we know the love of Jesus is just overflowing. And there's always that beckoning. Come on, come on, encouraging us to come closer. Let me fill you more with my spirit so my spirit can produce in you just bushels and bushels of fruit. He wants that for us. He needs that for us, for us to be effective and a powerful witness in this unbelieving world. I am so grateful 
that God recorded this story of Paul and Barnabas and Mark because we can learn and we can grow by it. Don't stop praying for someone who's producing at 30-fold. If anything, they need more prayer than anybody else. (laughs) You know, they may just be a John Mark in the making. (laughs) Maybe they're not ready for upfront Apostle Paul-type ministry, but they can work alongside a Barnabas out of the spotlight, being taught and encouraged to grow up into Christ in all things. We can be encouraged that just like Mark, if we're needing to grow up into Christ, if we remain surrendered and tender to the Lord, he will help us. He may send us a Barnabas. He may send us some challenging experiences so we can grow and we can learn. Don't get discouraged and quit. Jesus desires for all of us to produce fruit at a hundredfold in our lives all the time. And aren't you grateful for the Holy Spirit that he sends our way to help us and to do it? Every day our prayer should be, Lord, help me grow up into you today in every part of my life so I can be more effective for you. So this is just a little background now of the author of this gospel. And what's so wonderful about us seeing the humanity of Mark is God still uses him to tell the story of Jesus. God anoints him and calls him to write these powerful words. God uses people, (laughs) imperfect, regular people, with ups and downs, falls and flaws and failures, God uses people to do his work. He could have chosen perfect angelic beings. He could have chosen an angel to stand here this morning and share with you (laughs) the gospel of Mark, but he didn't. He chose an imperfect human being. When it comes to preaching the gospel, sharing the gospel, preaching to the lost, praying for unbelieving world, God uses regular people. Aren't you grateful that God uses regular people? He uses us in spite of ourselves. Amen? All right, let's look at Mark chapter one. Mark begins his writings, verse one, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the son of God. Gospel means good news. And I like the way that the living translation says this verse. This is the good news about Jesus, the Messiah, the son of God. You can almost imagine Mark with a megaphone. (laughs) This is the good news about Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. Truly, the gospel is good news because it presents to us Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God. Dr. Paul Reese, a Bible scholar and author, he described it this way. He said, the gospel is not open for discussion. It's not open for debate. It simply just is. It is an announcement. This is the good news of Jesus Christ, the Messiah. Then Mark goes on in verse two. As it is written in the prophets, behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way before you. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord make his path straight. Verse four, John came baptizing in the wilderness and preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. And we're gonna stop there this morning. Mark backs up this proclamation, this announcement. He backs up the gospel of Jesus Christ, the son of God, by making references to Old Testament prophets specifically Isaiah and Malachi. Now they had written years earlier of this wonderful event that was to come. Let me read this, Isaiah 40, verse three. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Then out of Malachi chapter three, verse one, Behold, I send my messenger and he will prepare the way before me. These were prophecies that had been given hundreds of years earlier. There was a messenger who was coming. He would be sent by God and his primary purpose was to prepare the way of the Lord. 
This messenger that the prophets were talking about was John, verse 4, John the Baptist. John the Baptist was a key component in the preparation of Jesus coming for his earthly ministry. And Mark is making reference to these Old Testament prophecies to show there was an order in which God's plan was fulfilled. God is a God of order. There was an order. And to remind his audience, these words did come true. Those Old Testament prophecies years ago, they came true. John the Baptist did come. He came baptizing in the wilderness and he came preaching a baptism of repentance to make preparation, make a way for the Lord. Now we're gonna spend more time on John the Baptist next week, but the truth I wanna leave with you today is God keeps his word. God keeps his word. He fulfills his promises. If he said he is going to do something, he will do it. The prophet had spoken of this messenger years earlier. And even during the 400 years of silence, that's the time between the Old Testament and the New Testament, 400 years of silence, there was no fresh word from the Lord. No fresh word spoken by God to to his, his priest or to a prophet. It seemed dead, lots of dry bones. There was nothing, 400 years of silence. But God had given his word. I will send a messenger. It might've been years and years ago, but his promises were still gonna be fulfilled. And the last part of that passage in Isaiah chapter 40, verse five says, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Is that not powerful? That just puts a seal on it. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. He gave the prophecy and that's that. We have a phrase at our house when something has happened and there it is. It's like, that's that, that's that. (laughs) The Lord, the mouth of the Lord has spoken. That's that. It sealed it. It settles it completely once and for all. His word is not going to return void. It's not going to return empty. It will come to pass. It will happen. And I just want to encourage you that it doesn't matter how many times the enemy puts doubt in your head or tries to erase these words from your spirit and your heart. His word remains settled forever in the heavens. Psalms 119.89. And if you're having a little trouble struggling with the power of the word, you get into Psalms 119. I know it's a long one and I think there's a point to that because it talks about over and over and over again, the power of the word, our safety is in the word, our reviving is in the word, our salvation is in, everything we need from the Lord is in the word. There is power in his word. It's not gonna go anywhere. It's here to stay. We can trust it when everything else around us is changing. I, I heard a little devotion today. Some of you who get the, who have the Bible on app, the U Bible, they've been doing the videos and the guy was sharing that this has been a very insecure time for him because of all the changes that are going. I wanna encourage you, you can trust the word. You can cling to the word. And that's what he was saying. You can trust in the Lord. You can cling to that word. It's never changing. It's remained settled forever. And if he gave a promise, if he gave the prophetic word, that's gonna happen. Amen, it's gonna happen. And Mark is reminding these believers in Rome, they're struggling, they're living in an ungodly society, great persecution. He's reminding us today, God's word can be trusted. Mark wrote the words of the Lord there. He said, verse two, behold, I send my messenger. And then down in verse four, it says, John came 
There might have been a lot of time between the I send my messenger and John came, but it eventually happened, praise the Lord. John did come, and he did begin the preparation of someone even greater. God's word did not lie. It will never lie. And I just want to leave you with that thought this morning. We can trust his word. We can believe his word. We can cling to his word. We can hold on to his word. It is forever settled in the heavens. Amen? Amen. Let's close in prayer. Father, I thank you this morning for your word today. Oh, thank you that it is forever settled in the heavens. It is not changing. It is solid. It is secure, Lord. When we feel insecure, we can run to the word and we can find a shelter and we can find a shield and we can find a refuge and a fortress because of your word, Lord. Encourage our hearts today. Let the Holy Spirit just bubble it up in us and resonate with us, Lord, that your word can be trusted and we can cling to it. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, touch your ladies today. Strengthen them. Remind them of your promises. You are with us forever in Jesus' name. You will never fail us. You will never forsake us. Your word has declared it, and we can hold on to that. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I pray a special blessing on each lady. Father, as she goes about her business at work, at home, with her family, God, give her strength. Give her strength, produce fruit in her this week, Lord, that she can be that effective witness you're calling her to be. We give you praise and glory for you are more than worthy. We thank you, Jesus. Amen, amen. The Lord bless you and we will see you next Tuesday, 10 o'clock and feel free to come in at nine also for a time of prayer. God bless you.